Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, SNOMED. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, and the honor to introduce our James Reed Memorial Lecturer today, Carolyn Gullery. Um, I am Ivan Boyd, and I'm from Dallas, Texas, if you've ever been there. Uh, and despite my title today, I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, I am representing our founder, though, Dr. Sidney Goldblatt of uh, Goldblatt Systems. If you attended the uh, SNOMED in Vancouver last year, perhaps you had an opportunity to meet Sid and uh, hear his vision of reinventing healthcare. As a governor of CAP, Dr. Goldblatt strongly supported SNOMED. Uh, he built SunQuest, SunQuest Information Systems, which was the first and really largest of all the uh, LIS system companies. And he helped establish uh, structured computable data as the basis for all lab information. His mission now is to change all of healthcare by using computable data instead of digital text. By combining the technologies we're developing with uh, standards such as SNOMED and some new solutions for managing genomic information such as machine learning, uh, he sees that future of precision medicine becoming really a reality. We're a company of healthcare and technology professionals dedicated to reinventing the way healthcare is delivered. For the past 40 years, we've been working with structured computable data, and for the past 20 years, we've been focused specifically on clinical semantic data, and in the last 10 years, on genomic testing and reporting. To change the world, we're looking for collaborators. We believe that this SNOMED CT audience is a target-rich environment for finding that. If you're interested in learning more, please stop by our booth or reach out to us on our website. The James Reed Memorial Lecture celebrates some of someone who embodies the practical application of SNOMED CT in a real-world setting. Honoring pioneer James Reed through this session, Ms. Gullery will share her experience in implementing SNOMED CT and some of the lessons she's learned in leading a progressive healthcare organization. For more than a decade in her role as the Executive Director of Planning, Funding, and Decision Support for Canterbury District Health Board of New Zealand, Carolyn has been a visionary enabling uh, relationships of a whole of system thinking and the Canterbury Health System. She's been a leading advocate of, alli of alliancing and healthcare and enabling the delivery of care at in home and in community care to minimize hospital admissions. Carolyn is working on a number of initiatives to address the social determinants of health outside of the healthcare system through collaborations with other sections, including uh, social welfare and education. The collaborative patient-centered model she has championed in Canterbury has been extensively reviewed by the King's Trust Fund and is cited as a model for integrated care systems being implemented in the UK. Carolyn has also been a sponsor to many technology projects to support collaborative ways of working, including clinical pathways, e-referral, shared health record, and care planning tools. The success of these projects has depended on creating a high trust environment and a strong set of relationships across all of the health system. Carolyn has been a champion of data-driven decision-making and integrating real-time reporting into both the health system planning and clinical decision-making. Carolyn is a driving force behind Canterbury DHB's reputation as a world leader in using healthcare analytics to operate, plan, and improve an integrated health system. Under her leadership, Canterbury undertook a world first with SNOMED with implementation of HCAS which applies natural language processing to the unstructured text-based data in the, in the clinical record. With over 1.5 billion SNOMED concepts tagged in the health record,
Canterbury DHB is using the written record in analytics and decision making to improve the health system. I have recently had the wonderful opportunity uh, to get to know her and uh, spend some time understanding her passion and energy that she has for changing the world. Having overcome things like earthquake disasters uh, and unformally, uh, unfortunately some terrorist activities that have gone on in New Zealand, uh, her healthcare organization under her leadership has uh, passed anything that stood in the way. So at this time, I'd like uh, to please welcome the, the uh, Memorial, the James Reed Memorial Lecture, Miss Carolyn uh, Gullery. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Greetings to you all. And thank you, Ivan, for such a, a, a wonderful introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Snowmead International, Kelly, for your work and for inviting me here. And I have to acknowledge Alistair Kenworthy, whose fault it is that I am here, because <laughs> he volunteered me. Um, he also uh, is actually one of our big supporters in New Zealand and has been a big supporter of, of Canterbury as we've gone along this journey. I'd also like to recognise um, Dr Christopher Lee, the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Health. Um, I'm going to repeat it again. The hospitality of your country and your colleagues is, has been nothing but exceptional and genuine from the moment um, I stepped off the plane. So it's been wonderful to visit here in Malaysia. I come from New Zealand. And I understand that when Snowmed was in New Zealand um, a couple of years ago, there was a little bit of a theme about Middle Earth. I'm not quite sure that um, Tolkien knew when he was writing um, The Lord of the Rings that ultimately it will become synonymous with New Zealand. If, in case you don't know, a lot of the filming was done around Canterbury. So actually, these are pictures from my, my home base. So. As, um, as was mentioned by Ivan, let's have a look about how you run a health system and use the data to tell the real story. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Canterbury first. So Canterbury wasn't a world-class health system when we started this particular journey. In fact, I think you could safely say that we were well and truly broken. Um, we had a high-performing primary care system, but our hospital-based system was um, a little bit leaving a bit to be desired. It was broken by um, the same things that trouble most health systems in the world, which is contracts, transactions, lack of integration of health systems, lack of integration of information. To give you a sense of scale, Canterbury looks after a population of about 580,000 people. We're a district health board. We are a crown-owned entity. We have our own board, which is partly elected and partly appointed by our government. We're given roughly $1.8 billion per annum to deliver healthcare services to our population. We own the hospitals, um, but we fund primary care, community care and long-term care for the elderly. So we're a kind of a mixture of a funder and a provider. My particular role in the health system is to figure out how to plan the entire system what kind of activity we're going to have to deliver and also manage that funding so that actually we allocate the resources across the health system in a fair way. So Canterbury's population has been growing quite fast, particularly since the earthquakes that Ivan mentioned. In fact, it's one of the fastest growing populations in New Zealand. We employ 10,000 people in our system, so they're the people running the major acute hospital, we are the second biggest tertiary hospital provider in New Zealand as well. So not only do we look after our own population, we actually provide services for the million or so people who live in the South Island of New Zealand, and also quite a few people in the North Island with some specialty services that only we deliver. There's probably about 10,000 people working in the rest of the health system. So that's general practice, community nursing, pharmacy, long-term care for the elderly, those kind of um, workforces. So between the two, there's about 20,000 people working in the Canterbury Health System. When we started, 
we were uh, spectacular at not doing it well. So Canterbury cancer patients were more likely to wait for radiotherapy than anyone else in New Zealand. We had an overcrowded ED, gridlocked hospitals, we cancelled surgery on a regular basis, we had threatened industrial action, we, um, our hospital clinicians and our general practice clinicians didn't talk to each other, uh, they sort of fired patients over the wall between uh, the two parts of the system. And in 2006, we made headline news throughout the country by unceremoniously removing 6,000 people off the waiting list so that we would meet the government's waiting times targets. So essentially what we said is if you've been waiting longer than six months for access to specialist services, bye. And we send everybody a letter. Now, at that time, I was actually the chief executive of the primary health organisation, and rather than actually working for the district health board, we picked up those 5,000 people and we managed them back through the system. The opportunity was to learn why the system didn't work. And we made a commitment to ourselves collectively at that time that it was never, ever going to happen again in Canterbury. We were never going to remove people from a waiting list in such an arbitrary way. So, at that time, which was about 2007, out, the board of the Canterbury District Health Board wanted to build a new hospital. Because isn't that how we solve all of our problems in health systems? We go and build a new hospital. We add more capacity. We build more theatres. So they wanted to build a new hospital. To do that, they had to do a health services plan. So we started doing a health services plan. At that time, I changed jobs because we had a chief executive of the district health board who wanted to integrate a health system. And he thought by employing the chief executive of the primary health organisation as his planning and funding manager, he might be able to bring the two pieces of the system together. So we did some really simple analysis. What it said is if we kept on doing what we were doing in 2007, then by 2020, we were going to need another 400 acute hospital beds another 2,000 aged care beds, and another 8,000 more people working in the health system. That was the catalyst that changed the trajectory of the Canterbury Health System. That's when all of the clinicians across the entire health system engaged. That's when they said, oh, that can't be done. We have to come up with a better way. So what we did is we went to our board and we said, um, we're going to build an integrated health system. We're going to do something entirely different. So we took them the health services plan and we said, don't sign off on this. Allow us to do something different. I'm going to tell you what something different looks like, but first of all, I'm going to tell you if it works. So you hear around the world about the concept of an integrated health system. So we built an integrated health system centred around people that aims not to waste their time it's all centred around Agnes, that's Agnes in the middle there, living in her own home and community and not in our institutions. We set out to prove that actually by integrating health systems, you can actually bend the curve. Just before you see the rest of the data, just get to understand our population. So when we started the journey, we had about 470,000 people in Canterbury. We've now got about 580,000. We had about 60,000 people over the age of 65. We've now got 93,000 people over the age of 65. We had about 30,000 Māori. We now have 51,000 Māori. So those are the kind of statistics that we've had between 2006, 2007 to now. So what's actually happened in terms of the health system? So first of all, ED attendances. So our ED attendances in Canterbury are 188 per thousand compared to the national average of 239 per thousand. Those numbers are about half of the rate of the NHS in the UK. Now, and you can see that Canterbury is significantly lower than the rest of the country. But more importantly, the ED attendances for people over the age of 65, we sit at 254 per thousand compared to 339 nationally. 
we deliberately set about keeping frail elderly people out of our emergency departments, out of our hospitals. We look after them in their own home because we recognise by looking at the data that if they ended up in our hospital, they then ended up in age residential care for the rest of their life. So we keep them in their own home. What does this mean? We have a 30% lower acute medical admission rate than the New Zealand average. Turning that into other kinds of numbers, if we were admitting at the same rate as the rest of the country, we would have had 16,000 more people in our hospital last year. Aged care, we were the best in New Zealand at putting people into long-term care for the elderly. We had 16% of the country's long-term care beds when we only had 12% of the country's population over 65. We made sure that you got in there nice and early so that you could stay a good long time. In fact, if you got into age residential care in 2007, 50% of you would still be there six years later. Now it's about 50% of you will still be there about 20 months later. We have not only not needed 2,000 additional aged care beds, we actually have 700 empty aged care beds in Canterbury now. And hospitals, remember those 400 additional beds we needed? What we've actually managed to do is reduce not only the number of people coming into our hospital despite that increase in population, but significantly reduce their length of stay. So on average an acute admission in Canterbury stays 2.2 days. And then they go home with the right support at home. That means we are currently using the same number of acute medical bed days now as we did in 2006-07 with all of those extra people living in Canterbury. So yes, you can bend the curve. How do you do that? Well, one of the things we did is we changed the whole pattern of how the system worked. So for example, ambulances. Ambulances would be called to someone's home. Chronic obstructive airways disease was a very common reason. And instead of taking the person to hospital, they could take them to their general practice, they could take them to our 24-7 intermediate care facility, or they could leave them at home and we provide the services in the patient's own home. So then what you can see here is that from 2010-11, we haven't had any, any increase in the number of ambulances arriving in our emergency department. We specifically changed how we looked after chronic obstructive airways disease. We recognised that they were it was using two wards in our hospital in winter, because actually New Zealand doesn't build houses very well for winter, so everybody gets cold and sick in the middle of winter. Um, but what we did is change the pattern and we empowered ambulance officers to keep people at home. Immediately a third of the people who called an ambulance didn't get transported to hospital. What that has meant is that we've gone from 8,000 bed days for chronic obstructive airways disease in the middle of winter to 4,000, so halved it. Falls prevention. Uh, we don't do any better than anyone else at preventing falls in hospitals, but we do exceptionally well at preventing them in the community. So what we've managed to do is by implementing a really simple program in the community is absolutely reduce the number of times that frail elderly people fall and fracture their hip. What that's meant over the last seven years, we've had three and a half thousand less ED attendances. We've had nearly a thousand less fractured hips. And that means 66,000 less bed days over those seven, seven years of people who would have been in our hospital with a fractured hip. We did two things. One is we stopped them from falling. Two, if they do fall, they don't hurt themselves quite so much. And three, if they end up in our hospital, they get fast-tracked. So we've reduced the amount of time at every point in the process. And what that has meant is that if you do fracture your hip in Canterbury, then you're also more likely to survive. As we know, fracturing a hip for frail elderly people is quite often a life-ending event. But because of the way the system works now, um, people are much less likely to die. And ethnicity and equity. Equity is a big issue in, in New Zealand. Um, our Māori population has poorer uh, longevity and earlier morbidity. What we've been able to do with the way we've designed services, particularly with the focus on looking after people in their own homes, is start to shift that curve. 
So we're now down to the gap in terms of mortality between Māori and non-Māori in Canterbury as being about two years. Nationally, it's seven. At the pace at which we're closing the gap in 15 years, we will be even and we will have addressed a core part of the inequity issues. Supporting people's end of life. We all talk about end of life and that's been a common um, comment amongst health systems about what do you do at the end of life and I, there was that statistic that keeps on being quoted that I'm not entirely sure is real, which is that twice you, know, you use um, twice as much of your total expenditure at the end of life. What we've been able to do with our shared health record and our shared planning is have advanced care plans that are live on the system that everyone can access. Those advanced care plans, because they're live, because they're trusted, we have 98% compliance. So when somebody arrives in our hospital with an advanced care plan, then it's 98% compliance with the wishes of the person. That's meant that over that time frame, we've gone from 32% of the people over 75 who will die this year in Canterbury dying in a hospital to 26%. And we think we can do better. So this is about people having that chance to end their lives in the way that they would like. And most people would choose to die at home. Not everyone, but most people. Other measures of performance, just to give you a sense, immunisation, um, breast screening, cervical screening. But one of the big ones that I just want to point out to you, remember when I started, you were least likely to get your radiotherapy on time in Canterbury? We now sit at about 98% compliance with the government's 62-day timeline for delivering um, definitive care for cancer. And we do significantly better than the rest of the country. So this is how you can make a health system really work. So, how did we do it? We did it by building a platform. So we organise our system on a platform. We have a range of services and ways of working that connect up a system in a seamless way. It's based on a shared vision, a connected system, connected by relationships, connected by information, connected by pathways, that's centred around people and aims not to waste their time. So the core metric of the Canterbury Health System is a really simple one. It's how much time of patients are you wasting? And if you can reduce the amount of time that you waste on a patient's time in their journey, then it's the right thing to do. Because everyone can measure time. And it means that we can empower an entire system of 20,000 people to do it better. Now, remember I said we did a health services plan and we went to the board. We took a really large, large thick document. You know, those health services plans are always you know, good and thick. And we said to the board, don't sign off on this. Well, it seems a bit odd. We'd spend 18 months writing it. Um, but what we said instead is don't sign off on this because we don't think this is the right answer. What we'd like you to do instead is agree that we pursue these three strategic goals. We redesign the health system around supporting people to look after themselves, supporting people in a primary and a community-based setting, and freeing up hospital-based specialists to do what only they can do. And we also say there's only one budget. Now, that's not true. <laughs> there's multiple budgets running in a health system in New Zealand, just like everywhere else in the world. But we act as if there's only one budget, so that we can remove all those perverse barriers that used to exist where we said, no, 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 we're not going to do the CT scan. We know you need one, but I don't want to use my budget to pay for it, so I'm going to refer to someone else and they can do the CT scan. So we stopped all that and we said, if the patient needs the CT scan, then do it. Because this is actually about our budget, the Canterbury Health System's budget. It's always about people and it's about not wasting their time. The District Health Board's job is to buy the right thing but we're not there to tell the clinicians how to do the right thing. We're there to enable them to get the right job done in the right way. And it's about using information. Information to plan, information to understand the needs of our population, and information to drive service improvement. We use empowered networks, alliances, both across Canterbury and across the whole of the South Island. 
I trust low bureaucracy contractual arrangements that enable us to rapidly improve a health system based on the fact that we all succeed together or we all fail together. So no, no competition, this is collaboration. And it's an adaptive leadership model. And it starts with the prospect that everybody comes to work each day to do a good job. And if they're not doing a good job, it's because the system's not working right, not because the people aren't. So we start with trust. And actually, someone asked me about this the other day, and I said, babe, the, the funder, which is my role, has to trust first. Because if the funder doesn't trust, you can't get trust into the system. So we trust clinicians. Then we redesign the care pathways. Then we move the money. So instead of having money and contracts drive a health system, we actually drive a health system based on what's best for the patient. How's it going to work in the right way? We know that it's resilient to external shocks because we've got had plenty of practice. And we know that actually this kind of adaptive way of working is, is possible to create a high resilient organisation. It's about keeping people in their own homes. It's about co-owned coordination an agreement between the clinicians and the system about how it is we're going to do it around here. And that's captured in a product we call Health Pathways, which is an online system. It's web-based deliberately so that we can rapidly change it. So we can change a clinical pathway in an hour. Usually we change them overnight, <laughs> but we can change them in an hour. And those pathways just guide people through our health system. They tell people exactly how it is, where they can get the resources from, who they refer to, what they need to do for the patient in front of them. They are so heavily used that 99% of general practitioners in Canterbury this week will look at health pathways. 70% of them will have looked at them today. They're an integral part of how the system works and we have health pathways for our community-based clinicians and health pathways for our hospital-based clinicians. In the background, they're all the same pathway. But from the way they're presented, they're presented relevant to the, what the work is that the person's doing. We also have pathways for the patients. So Health Info, so translating the system so that the patients can also understand what's going to happen for them. And we've moved beyond that into having a Health Pathways model, which we call Leading Lights, for schools, so that teachers have access to the information they need to provide the best possible response to the students in front of them. And so they know what resources in the health system they can access when they have troubles. And they can also now electronically refer to general practice, so that we can actually have a conversation now going on between teachers and general practice about the health and wellbeing of their student population. It's all held together by a shared orientation, which is an outcomes framework, because actually this is a contribution type model. This is where everybody contributes to the outcomes for the Canterbury Health System, for keeping Canterbury people well and healthy and in their own homes and out of all of our institutions, including our hospitals. And this is the reason we built an outcomes framework like this is because most outcomes frameworks are linear. They're you do this and you get that. It doesn't work in an integrated system. Everybody has to play their part. We have a number of services that look after people in their own home. One of the major ones is the Acute Demand Management Programme, where you become unwell in Canterbury and you would otherwise be in a hospital. General practice can wrap an entire service response around you in your own home. 34,000 people a year get this response. And what we know is when general practice General practices that use this more often than others have a 40% lower acute admission rate, particularly for the elderly. So this is a genuine way of keeping people in their own home and out of our hospital-based setting safely. And interestingly enough, the patients prefer it. So the other programs we have, a whole range of programs wrapped around particularly older people to keep them wealthy, to keep them healthy, keep them on their feet and out of our hospital-based settings. General practice is enabled to do a whole lot of things that in other systems, even in New Zealand, are only done in hospitals. Because they, hospitals are free and general practice in a New Zealand-based setting costs money, we actually fund general practice to do a whole lot of work that previously would be only done in a hospital-based setting. 
and we've built our information systems to support. So we have Health One, which is a shared health record. It's a fully shared health record that runs across the entire South Island. So if you turn, into a, turn up in a pharmacy, you turn up in a general practice, you turn up in our hospital, they can all see the same thing in context. It's updated every 20 minutes. So if you've been to see your GP this morning, by the time you get to the hospital, that your health record would have been updated and the hospital can see everything that they need to know. But this is about data and about data analysis and about data being trusted. So we use data in our health system in three key ways. One is to provide the right information at the point of care so that when our clinician is seeing a patient, they've got everything they need to know about that patient, which is everything that everybody else knows about that patient as well. Then we use real-time data to run operational decisions. So if you walk around our hospitals, you'll see dashboards that will tell you how many people are in the hospital, how many people are sitting in ED, how long they've been in ED, who's leaving today, so that we can manage what is a really, really tight system, because actually we have less beds now than we had in 2007, we can manage that tight system because we understand how the patients flood through it. And then it's using data for planning, for forecasting, for future projections, and most importantly, for service improvement. It's all clinically led and clinically enabled. So one of the things that makes it work for Canterbury is that clinicians can see and use the data directly themselves. And so this is actually our general medicine team with the data on the wall behind them and our seeing the system room where they can actually see all of that data and they can interact with it. It's about making it usable, making it intuitive and making it accessible. It anchors the conversations. It enables us to have the challenging conversations with clinicians about how can we do this better. We're not, we take a patient journey approach to this. So we always think in terms of journeys and how patients get through the system. And then we can tag um, metrics against each of that point in the journey so we can know immediately and live whether we're actually doing better or worse and where our opportunities for improvement lie. Like everywhere else in the world, we have disparate sources of data. We're dealing with legacy systems. Some of them are you know, almost older than the people in this room. But we actually pull all of that legacy data together into a data warehouse. And out of that data warehouse, we drive our real-time um, analysis, but also our long-term analysis as well. So we don't use the actual systems themselves. We pull that data through, we link it up, we um, apply new business rules to it, and we make it work in a different way. So, just a brief pause. You understand the journey, you know that it works. What did we do next? So we, we got quite good at using data. We got people used to using it, but there's all of this untapped data in the system because clinicians write notes. So that's when we thought we needed to tap in to the different kind of data. So this is our opportunity. We had a data warehouse where we keep all of the data in the system. We had health pathways, which is a structured way of looking at how you process people through the system. We had shared health records, so we had the richness of the information from across the system, and then we had SNOMED. So, standardising workflows, that's what happens with Health Pathways, it actually standardises the workflow across our health system in a responsive and um, way, of, way of doing it that we can actually change, as I said, within an hour. We also have electronic referrals so that we're able to transfer clinical documentation between various parts of the system, as I said, even the schools now, um, electronically and therefore capture it on the way through. And we had a data warehouse that enabled us to capture the patient's journey. And our data warehouse strategy is deliberate in that we pull all of the data into the data warehouse and then we feed the various tools that we use for analysis rather than using the tools themselves as the core repositories of our data. And then, as I said, we have a shared health record. We have um, plans and health records for a million people across the whole of the South Island. We have a shared clinical portal for our hospital-based clinicians that runs across the whole of the South Island. 
and we have an electronic request management system that takes information from general practice to everywhere else in the health system that's used about 200,000 times a month. It's integrated into the patient management system. It's a closed loop so that when a general practitioner refers into another system, they get a response, they know the referral's been received. We can triage online, so we can actually provide advice back, or we can actually see the patient, whatever happens to be the right thing to do. It's deliberately called a request management system because the patients are the general practice patients and where they're requesting support for their patients, not handing them over to another clinician. So, and SNOMED. So thanks to um, the Ministry of Health, we have SNOMED CT, it's our principal standard. And um, obviously we have the New Zealand edition, just as everyone else does, have their own specific edition with their own extensions. So that was our first step into moving beyond structured data. So we poured a whole lot of data into a system and the initial run, we discovered 86,000 unique SNOMED concepts in our data systems. This is off five source data systems. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that shortly. So what is HCAS? HCAS is a system that we use to read the unstructured data in our system. It enabled us to go beyond only using 20% of your data to actually using more. It is a simple healthcare analytics system. It's a combination of a, a um, natural language processing system and a Vertica database. It enabled us um, to pull in that data that previously we'd been unable to access. At the moment we have two billion coded SNOMED tags in our system. And all of that has come off unstructured data. So how did we get there? Why did we get there? Uh, as usual, something went wrong and we needed a solution. Now I had a chief of radiology who was very keen on being able to connect radiology data with lab data, and as we know, that's in two different systems and they don't talk to each other. And so she asked me to solve that problem and get them to talk to each other, and I said, hmm, I don't think I just want to have labs and radiology talk to each other. I'd like to get everything talking, so let's see if we can find a system that would do that. We actually found one. It wasn't being used in health, but we found one in um, Hewlett-Packard, which was this combination of IDLE, which is a natural language processing system with Vertica database. Just out of interest, um, that calculi term turned up in 10,700 records, so it was reasonably material. So where are we going? We haven't quite got to one ring to rule them all, but um, where does it fit in our future? Well, as we know, a number of people are starting to use SNOMED in their core systems, and in fact, in New Zealand, we already have ACC ambulance and our emergency department's about to start using SNOMED so that we can actually start to transfer information rapidly in timely ways. Data is expanding all the time around us. We've moved on from the what to the why. The why is so important because it helps us understand how it is that we can make the system work better. But the new data in health, I mean, there's a whole lot of new things coming and how are we going to use them, how are we going to bring them in. Some of them won't be standardised, some of them come in various and different forms. So we'll need to apply new ways of thinking and new analytical systems to that new data as it hits us. For HCAS, it's got a pipeline of improvement. It's developing some direct API ontology tagging. It's got machine le learning to improve the negation issue. Um, predictive modelling and it's now bringing a whole range of new BI tools into the Vertica database which means we can have a bit of fun now and create some different ways of looking at data and, and different um, projections. And where are we going? That holy grail. How can we predict the outcomes in a health system? How can we predict system level outcomes and outcomes for the individual person? You may have noticed these kind of graphs turning up in our um, presentation. It's a product called Signals from Noise, which is by Lightfoot, a UK company, 
It is core to our health system. It uses our, it's our stats predictive system. It's live, it's updated every day. It can tell me how many people are going to arrive in our emergency department at 10 o'clock next week. So every day in our system, I can tell you how many people are going to arrive today, how many people are going to arrive in our emergency department from now until midnight, constantly and continuously updated. So we use that all the time as a way of planning our system, getting the resources in the right place and making sure that um, we have the right staff in the right place to meet the needs. It also helps us identify our opportunities for improvement. But the opportunity that sits with that is when we can bring the unstructured data into that structured kind of analysis and prediction. The other things we can do are things like this. This is one of my um, more exciting opportunities out of our data warehouse and a shared health record. If you arrive in our hospital today, overnight, we will look at your shared health record. We will see what pharmaceuticals you had dispensed most recently. We'll run an algorithm across that with a few other parameters that we know about you. And tomorrow morning, our pharmacist team will have a prioritised list of who they need to see first for medicines reconciliation. Who are the most at risk patients in our, in our hospital today based on what we knew about them when they arrived yesterday. And as I said, if we can take the output of our unstructured data, add it to our structured data, then our opportunity to predict becomes significantly better. One of the things we've also been able to do is streamline our health pathways. So we now have an opportunity that if you're using um, a clinical system that's NOMED enabled, we can then go and search the health pathway server and come back to you with the right health pathways that are going to be most relevant to the patient that you have in front of you. And then that improves over time as it continually, um, as it gets used, used, it gets better and more accurate in providing you with the right pathways. So at a national level, um, it's been adopted. There's a national release centre. The IT vendors are catching on to the fact that SNOMED CT is um, a core part of our system. It's got a, a way to go, but we're on the journey to having a common clinical vocabulary and that's um, what this room is all about. So that's kind of the end of my story, but some final thoughts. This is a way of working. It's a whole of system response. It's a whole of system thought broadly, health and social care. How do we make a difference to our population? How do we keep them well and healthy? How do we keep them living their best possible lives? It drives change based on best care for the person in the context of their family, their whānau, their community. It works irrespective and despite the structures. Everyone in this room has been committed to making a difference. And something that, that always I find really um, empowering is this quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because indeed it's the only thing that ever has. So thank you, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Carolyn, that was amazing. Not only the evolution that the Canterbury District Health Board has gone through, but also the short window with which you've been able to enrich the data within Canterbury with SNOMED and really mobilize some of your decision making. Um, I have a mic here, Alison's got a mic over there. We'd love to open up the floor for any questions and we'll, we'll bring it over to you. I think maybe I have one just to start. Um, how does it work in terms of clinicians getting access to the data that Canterbury is using, the SNOMED encoded data? Like, Are they allowed to, to get in there to do their own analysis? Yeah, so the way we work the system is that those clinicians who want to learn how to use the tool have an opportunity to train and they can go straight into the tool themselves. So it's quite a simple tool, so um, you can even play at a high, at a like, high level. Um, even I can get quick answers out of the tool. Um, otherwise, we have a team of dedicated analysts who will sit alongside clinicians and help them if they want to dig deeper into the data. So it's a mixture of both. 
but any clinicians that work in the Canterbury Health System um, can have access to the tool. Thank you. Hi, Caroline. My name is Andy. Amazing presentation, and um, you should be commended on the incredible uh, progress you've made in improving the lives of so many people. It's, it's truly remarkable. And I found myself kind of dividing your journey into the two halves. The first half, which was about process and people and leadership and all the rest, and then the second half on the technology. And, and for those of us who have been working for so long um, in the technology space, in the information system space, to see you have overcome so many of the challenges and at scale, <laughs> um, it, it's, uh, it's mind boggling in many ways, especially coming from the United States. Um, where people don't trust the data, um, the, the amount of the data that's bad in the system, you know, it would, putting it all in one place would be just a disaster, actually. Um, <clears throat> so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, the evolution in how you to install the technology. Was there a lot of piloting that was going on? Um, how did you overcome some of these challenges around normalization of the data? Um, it's, it's just, these are huge burdens that we've been seeing, and yet you've developed this amazing outcome at scale in a very short, it's almost unbelievable. <laughs> and so if you would talk a little bit about how you integrated the technology and tr began to trust it, or how you worked with the vendors, all that kind of stuff, in, in 30 right. seconds. <laughs> in, the, in a pretty short space of time. Yeah. Um, that is a fantastic question, because I think it's core. Um, when we started this journey in 2007, um, the clinicians didn't trust the data at all. Uh, they, they liked to go off and do their own analysis and come up with their own data because they certainly didn't trust the data that the planning and funding team had because we were the nasty bureaucrats and we would just be going to use the data to beat them up. So we had to go through quite a journey on that. And one of the things that we, one of our roles that we made right at the beginning was that we would only use routine data. So all of the work that's done in the Canterbury Health System is based off routine data. We don't go and collect special data to support a particular pilot or project. We go, it's got to be routine data because it's already there. And by using routine data, that actually means the routine data gets better because people realise it's being used. In terms of how do we get the clinicians engaged, um, we started working with the willing. It's the classic tactic, find the people who want to work with you, work with them, and demonstrate to the rest of the system that by engaging um, with us, they were actually got some of the things solved that they'd always been trying to solve. The other thing we did is we actually sat in the room with the clinicians with the data and analysed it in front of them. So, for example, that tool uh, that I talked about, Signals from Noise, was a really pivotal tool for us because you can actually analyse it live on the fly. So you have a bunch of clinicians in the room and they say, oh yeah, but that can't be right. So for example, um, we did that with chronic obstructive airways disease and we showed that if they got admitted under a respiratory, they stayed for six days and if they got admitted under general medicine, they only stayed for four. So the respiratory physician said, oh, well, we must have all the complex people. And we went, oh, okay, shall we look? And so we did. And it turned out that they actually get all the simple people, they get the people that only have chronic obstructive airways disease, and all of the frail, elderly, multi comorbid people go to general medicine. So, which is the complete opposite of what they believe. But because we could analyse it in front of them, and because we could ask the oh, but question, and then said, oh, let's have a look, it actually engaged them. And that started the journey of people beginning to trust the data because you could actually answer their challenges and you could do it in front of them, you could do it live. You didn't go away and write another report and bring it back. So was our data good when we started? No. But because people started to see it being used, because it began to be fed, fed back, because we made it visible, because we put it up on the walls, because we sat in the room with them, because we gave them access to the data, we built tools that they could use, the data improved dramatically and they engaged with it. And now it's a point of pride um, for the clinicians in the Canterbury system that they all trust the data, they all believe in. And the other thing that we do, and it's, it's kind of sound a little strange, we update our clinical systems regularly. 
even if we just have to change the colour, <laughs> just so that we've got everybody used to the idea that your clinical systems will refresh and change, so that you don't have this big drama of deploying you know, the, the next updated version of any particular system. So every month, irrespective, it rolls out, systems are updated. And we've got to the point now where the clinicians are hungry for change. And in fact, when people come and visit our system, uh, we got some feedback one time that the clinicians were a little bit worried that the executive management team had got tired because they hadn't seen enough change recently. So, and so it's completely changed the whole culture of a system that was yeah, very resistant to change. But because they've been part of it, it's their journey. And one of the things we did over the first four years is we didn't say no to anyone. So if anyone came up with a bright idea, we went, okay, we'll work with you on that. So we moved away from the old fashioned clinicians coming up with bright ideas, go and write a business case so we can say no. Um, it was to, okay, let's work with you on that. Let's see where the data is coming from. Let's see how we can help you. So it's a, it's a whole cultural change. Did that, did that help? Thank you very much for the excellent presentation and more importantly for what you have done. It's uh, entirely unique and I would love to learn from you, but I, I get it, I think. You trusted people and people trusted you and the data. It's as simple as that. Can I ask a question though, that uh, you, you look forward to uh, what you're going to achieve. Have you had any chance to look into the genomics data in relation to whatever you have got or how, how, is, how that ties in? Because predictions probably will enable you to go further if you uh, sort of get the morphology and the genomics mm -hmm. data together somehow in the future. Uh, we haven't started that journey yet, um, but we are the second biggest tertiary lab in the country and we do have genomics capabilities. So it is on our roadmap, but um, no, we haven't started that journey yet. I'm a little bit nervous about it, I have to say, because uh, one of the things that we notice with what we've got now, and we've got 135 different um, sources of data running, uh, different parameters running through HCAS at the moment, it's a lot. Um, there's a huge amount of complexity and the, you know, the whole trick in doing this is to get to that simplicity on the other side of complexity. So I can worry about the complexity but I need to deliver the simple answers to the, to the clinicians who need to use it right now and I'm just, I'm nervous about the complexity when we start getting into that space but we will. Hi Carolyn. I know we talked yesterday. Yes. Um, it's Matt uh, from Ministry of Health. Um, thank you for the um, presentation. It was very nice. Um, I know we talked about the um, human skills <coughs> and the requirement. If you could share with us a little bit more on that, um, what it takes about um, building the skills oh. and the number of the people working in your team, um, because it seems like you've moved so fast. Uh, we started 2014, just like you, and now I can see the HCAS is 3.0 already. Um, and I can see the people, not just the, your team, but also the people has benefited from it. So if you could share with us a bit about the scale and number of people working in your team as the system grows, and maybe how dependent you are on the external members as well, how, you know, how it goes with your system. Yeah. Certainly, yes, thank you. We did talk yesterday. So the way that the Canterbury Health System works is we partner. Um, we have our own skills. We've got, I've got um, 100 people in my total team. In terms of the data warehouse and the analyst team, it's about 25 people. Uh, we have our own data warehouse developers so that we actually run our data warehouse for ourselves. We partner with organisations, so for example, HCAS. So rather than sort of using third party vendors that are at an arm's length and they give you their out of the box solution, we'd rather get in early with them and help them build the solution with them so that actually we get what we want out of the system. So the same thing happened, for example, with um, signals from noise. We started working with them in 2011. 
they had a, a giant sized stats engine that had worked with ambulances and with financial data. And so they've had to work alongside us to learn how to use all the rest of the data that's available in the health system and how you get tools out of that. So we, we have mixed teams where in fact we may have some vendor um, expertise but we also have our own expertise working alongside them because we find it it's more effective if we actually in-house the skills as much as possible so that they're actually part of our system and then we partner with um, other organisations and we grow and evolve together. I think we have time for one last question, but Carolyn has said that she'll be available during the break if others would like to, to raise some points of discussion. Charles? Hi, um, my name is Charles Gautrej, I'm from East London. Uh, I'd love to uh, add my congratulations to what you've presented and what you've done, fantastic. Um, you, you, you ended your piece by saying it's the people, it's the people. Can you share with us a bit how up till now and what your plans are for the future for in, for letting families, uh, patients, people use and share the data that you collect on their behalf? That's a really good question and I'd have to say that um, despite the fact that one of our core strategies was uh, providing the support for people to look after themselves, the area we haven't made as enough progress on is the whole patient portal and the patient ability to access the data. Consumers are integrally involved in all of our service design and development, so they sit on all of our teams that redesign services, but um, we haven't actually managed that integration yet. So we've got health info, which enables them to see the patient pathways in a generic form. The main reason we haven't done it is although we have a shared health record, which, as I said, links up all of the, the health system and is available in context. So if you're a general practitioner and you're looking at your patient management system and you're looking at Joe Smith, it's literally a push of an electronic button and you have Joe Smith in Health One, so the shared view. Uh, we haven't quite got over the security issues about how we would enable patients into that same system. So all we can do at the moment is, is give them access to their shared plans. So we have a personalised care plan that they can see, we have an advanced care plan that they can see, and we have an acute care plan that they can see, but we haven't got them into the personal system yet. But it is definitely on our roadmap. We just need to overcome the, the issue about letting people into what's actually a core um, health system. And with that, I think that we'll draw this particular session to a close. Can everyone please join me in what, um, congratulating Carolyn for her. At this point in time, I would like to invite Deputy Director General Lee from the Malaysian Ministry of Health up to deliver some closing remarks for the session. I can't believe it's the last day because the hall seems as full as it was on the first day. And that's special. I think for most conferences, as we all know, when it comes to the last day, uh, probably there are six people left in the room. <laughs> so, uh, wow. First, I uh, must congratulate Carolyn. You have saved Middle Earth. <coughs> that's good. Uh, I mean, Canterbury, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I would like to add my congratulations to that. It has certainly uh, opened up many of our people's eyes in Malaysia that what can happen and thank you for for that inspiration um, i feel a little bit guilty and a little bit nervous because uh, when just now when we were asking questions about the trust of the data uh, the bad guy seems to be the clinician i confess i'm a clinician <laughs> so i'm going to shrink down behold this podium uh, and you're right uh, when we first looked at this issue, at least from a personal perspective, I doubted the data. I would question the data again and again, where did you get this? How come it doesn't look like what I see on the ground? 
But I'm glad to say, uh, in that few years' time since I started work, looking at data from within the, my own hospital, uh, I've begun to trust the data a bit more because now I'm involved in that data. So it takes time, unfortunately. So bad people like me can still be saved. So there's hope for all my clinician friends who are still working in the hospitals now. So don't give up on us, please. Uh, we are not all bad guys. Uh, but uh, just to keep it very brief, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank many people for making this conference possible. Um, the list is very long. I don't intend to read the whole list because it will be here until tonight. Uh, so the persons who prepared the speech, I'm going to go off script. Uh, all right. So please, if I forgot your name and your organization or unit, please do not be upset, and please do not scratch my car, which is parked outside. Please, it, it, it's a government car, so give it a break. Okay? <laughs> give it a break. All right. Um, first, of course, Snowmap International. Thank you for the honor and the privilege of hosting this edition of Snowmap CT Expo. Uh, uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. I think all my Malaysian colleagues who are sitting at the back, we love to sit at the back, just in case you didn't know. Uh, and I think I'm very confident to say all of us have learned a lot from it. So perhaps to thank SOMAC International, especially our, my Malaysian colleagues who are in the room, please give them a strong round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. On a personal note, I have learned a lot. Uh, give me some more momentum to go back to the hospitals and work on the data and get things a little bit going. And uh, we'll remember Canterbury all the time. Uh, we have to thank a lot of sponsors who come forward to help the, the conference, a lot of partners and collaborators who have made this happen. Uh, I personally have to thank uh, the uh, Minister of Health who was here yesterday. Uh, who had a particularly strong passion about driving this agenda within the country. And uh, I think you have also encouraged him to go a bit stronger. So yesterday, before getting back to his office, he was telling us we have to work harder on this. So thank you for giving us extra work. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I I'm being sincere here, okay? I know I sound a little bit sarcastic, but I'm sorry, it's sincere. Uh, but his drive is in especially important for us because with his support, uh, I think resources flow down from the top of the hill. Uh, we have a long journey to go. I think yesterday he was here, he shared a little bit of what we have started. Uh, in some areas, we have moved a fair bit. In some areas, we have just started moving. But you're right, it's going to be a long journey. Um, and you've got to convert one clinician after another. So it takes a bit of time. Um, we do have to thank uh, uh, one particular team from within the Ministry of Health, Dr. Kaze and his team. I can't see where he is. Uh, oh, uh, I, I know it's a little bit Malaysian thing, but Kazi and your team, can you just stand up? Uh, that we want to, I want to thank you. Uh, can you stand up? Thank you. Okay. As you can notice, they are very shy. <laughs> uh, but thank you for all your hard work. I know. Uh, you, have done, uh, you guys have worked over time to, to get this going and I think you have made us proud and you have uh, been a good uh, host to all our colleagues who have come overseas. Uh, lastly, I just want to wish everybody uh, good travels, safe travels, uh, especially for those who have come a long way to come here to Malaysia. I hope you, we have welcomed you with our sunny skies in the morning and the rainy skies in the evenings. <laughs> I mean, we are good, we are good. We give you everything, that, the best we can offer. The plants grow very well here. <laughs> um, so thank you once again for making the time, the effort to come here to Malaysia for this conference. We thank you uh, for your comradeship and your, the networking that we are able to do for you. I know many of my colleagues here, my staff from Ministry of Health have been actively hunting many of you down. I apologize if they look a bit rude or anxious, uh, but they, they are kind of hungry for inspiration and, and knowledge as well. Particularly, I'd like to thank Don Tweet. Uh, I, yesterday, I, when we were going through the gift, uh, booths, I think I mentioned this to you. Because he looked the part. He looked very proud. In, in a good way. You know, people can be proud in a bad way, but he was proud in a very good way. And I could see that the journey for him has been uh, long, but rewarding, definitely. So I do want to personally thank Don for all his efforts in getting us ready. Thank you very much, Don.
<laughs> so with that few short words, I know uh, you still have some sessions that you may have to go to later. Uh, I wish you a safe journey back home. And for all the Malaysians, finish this conference, please go back to work, okay? <laughs> in, case, in case you forget. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.